Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may God's rich grace, mercy, and peace be with you now and always. Amen. Please join me in prayer. We bow our heads. Almighty God and merciful Lord, we thank you for sending your Son, Christ Jesus, to be the sacrificial Lamb, the one who has given his life so that we might have life. We pray that always that we would live as your people, that we would love as your people, that you would lead us so that all may come to know you as their Lord and Savior, as their King, the Ancient of Days. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now, the rest of the story. Clearly, my voice is not as rich as Paul Harvey's, but many of you probably know those immortalized words of Paul Harvey. And now, the rest of the story. Paul Harvey was a conservative talk show host who, for years, who shared the, the news, not in the way that many hosts do today, shouting and raising their voices, but he used story, he used alliteration, and he used this beautiful tone that kind of carried you right along. Even if you remember listening to Paul Harvey's news segments, Half the time you didn't even realize when he was transitioning from the, the news into one of his advertisements and back into the news, except for the fact there'd be a phone number somewhere in there. You know, Paul Harvey, he, he left a lot of memories. And, and uh, one of those is, uh, if you, he passed away in 2009, but one of those memories was in 2013, uh, the Super Bowl, one of the commercials involved his, his, right, uh, or his p piece, so, so God made uh, the farmer. Maybe some of you remember that. that on the eight, he starts it out, on the eighth day, God made the farmer. Well, there are other important things that Paul Harvey left us with. And one of those things might be another essay that you remember him writing. In 1964, Harvey wrote an essay called, If I Were the Devil. It wasn't until 1965 that he recorded that for the first time. Then he re-recorded it and re-recorded it, probably the last time being in 2009, shortly before his death. But he wrote this piece, If I Were the Devil, as a commentary on the America that he saw. Now, I won't share the whole thing with you. If you'd like, there are plenty of copies out there. You can listen to audio transcripts of it. But I want to share a few pieces of it with you this morning. And Harvey wrote, If I Were the Devil... I mean, if I were the prince of darkness, I would, of course, want to engulf the whole earth in darkness. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper, the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what is bad is good and what is good is square. With flattery and promises of power, I could get the courts to rule what I construe as against God and in favor of pornography, and thus I would evict God from the courthouse and then from the schoolhouse and then from the houses of Congress and then in his own churches I would substitute psychology for religion. In other words, if I were Satan, I'd just keep on doing what he's doing. Paul Harvey, good day. Harvey paints a fairly dire picture of America. And if you were to read the rest of what he wrote, you would see that it, the most of the rest of that essay continues that way. Almost prophetic, the way he looked at the world, looked at the state of our world. He wondered what the world would look like if the devil was given free reign. He wondered... And I wonder what he would have said if he was still writing today. Maybe some of you wonder, maybe not from the same viewpoint as Paul Harvey, but maybe you've wondered about where the world is going today. Maybe you've looked around you and you've wondered, what opportunities would your children have? How would things be different? Maybe you've thought back nostalgically to times when you could run to the grocery store and, well, for just a quarter maybe even a nickel, get some candy. Maybe you wonder times when it was safe to run to the grocery store on your own. Maybe you remember times when the Internet was something that was just used by the government, not used globally yet. Maybe you wonder where the world is heading. What's going to happen? What your children, what your grandchildren will face. Will they still be able to worship together in the house of the Lord? 
Will they still be able to have the freedom to pray, to share their faith? For some of us, maybe our thoughts are not so grandiose as that. Maybe we are confined to wondering about the things in our day-to-day lives. We wonder about the fact that well, Christmas is right around the corner. And we wonder how we'll have time to decorate. How we'll have time and money to buy the presents that our children and grandchildren need. Maybe you wonder about the education of your kids. If they will be able to go to college. If you'll be able to afford to put them through college. Or if your grandchildren will be able to go to college. Maybe you wonder about what your medical test will reveal. You wonder about what medicines you'll have to take. What procedures you'll have to go through. You wonder about what's next. And I know some of you, you wonder, as your friends die around you, how long? You wonder how long you have and if you'll be ready to go when the Lord calls you. The list could go on and on, couldn't it? What do you wonder about? When you look at the future, what do you wonder about? What is it that goes through your mind? What is it that when you lay awake at 2.29 in the morning, do you think about that keeps you from falling back asleep? What do you wonder about? It seems like every person has something that they wonder, they worry about. Things that they wrestle with, they struggle with. They look at this world around us and they wonder, where is God in this world? You know, our world is not so different from Daniel. It's true, Daniel didn't have the internet. He didn't have television or radio. But certainly, he lived in a world that was entirely anti-Christian. He lived in a world that was, well, not just anti-Christian, but violently against Christianity. Well, actually, we're not to Christianity yet. I apologize. Let me back up. That was against Judaism, against the teachings of God. And this is important because Daniel, throughout his time in Babylon, when he wrote this book that we read today, throughout his time in Babylon, he shared his faith in God. He shared his faith in the sovereign God, the true God, the almighty God. And he used a name for God that is used no other place in the Bible. It's used three times in Daniel chapter 7. He called God the Ancient of Days. And I love this name for God because it reveals the truth of Daniel's faith in God. He knew that even though He was in a place that was anti-Christian, a place that was anti-God, that he could trust the Lord Almighty, the Ancient of Days. And that name, it embodies this beautiful image of God, the majesty of God. As Chris was reading, did you see the way he was described? The power. And truly that name, if translated directly from the Aramaic, it actually is the one who precedes all days. Our God is the one who is before, who is the beginning, the end. The one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Our God, the Almighty One, is the one in whom we can trust. And then the one who has given His life for us. When we think about it, the Almighty God of the universe, He bound Himself to a little baby in the womb of Mary. The wisdom who has given wisdom to all man found himself to the form of an embryo in the womb. Fragile and weak. Born, bloody, crying and screaming. The ancient of days, in the form of a babe, clutched to his mother's breast, trusting she would care for him. The ancient of days, all-powerful, who grew up, who did not wield his power and and show off and act as though he were above all else, but humbled himself, worked alongside his father, humbled himself, and although he could call down legion upon legion of angels, allowed the Jewish guard to take him into custody, although he could have delivered himself chose to be delivered over to death for us. 
the ancient of days, the almighty king. He gave his life for us so that we would have the promise, the promise of this beautiful image, an image of eternity with him, a day without end, the ancient of days. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. The beautiful image of the Ancient of Days. The promise of eternal life as John gives us in Revelation. The promise of life beyond this world. A hope. And yet, we live in this world. We live in this world where sometimes it seems like the Almighty King who has delivered us from death, that He seems otherwise occupied. We live in this world that seems to have spun out of control, that His hand is no longer involved. We live in this world where Paul Harvey can write, if I were the devil, and well, it sounds like he seems to be right on. We live in this world that pictures God as a kindly old grandpa who rocks away at his rocking chair, not realizing how broken broken the world is, how messy it has become. At least that's what the foe wants you to believe. The foe wants you to look at this world, to look at your life, and to think that all is lost. Because that is what he does. Our foe, the old evil foe, Satan, constantly works to destroy faith. He constantly works to tear us away from the trust in God, the hope that we have in our Lord for eternal life. He constantly works to tear us away so that we wonder if the devil were indeed in control. And yes, there is a lot of garbage going on in our world today. Yes, there is a lot of awful things that happen. There are parents who outlive their children. There are husbands and wives who are getting divorced. There is a world that is becoming increasingly immoral. But there is a God who is the almighty God of the universe who is in control. His word tells us that he is still in control. That even in the midst of this mess, that he is the one who is sovereign. And we don't use that word a lot in the Lutheran church. So let me just again remind you what sovereign means. Some of you know it because you remember your old King James. But it means that he is the supreme ruler. There is no power above him. There is no power beyond him. He is the all-powerful God. He is the ancient of days. And we are his people. We are the children of the Almighty God who live in this world, who have the gift and opportunity to bring hope to this world, to proclaim that we know the King. That we know the King. The One who is in control. Now the foe, he's going to keep trying to lead you away from that hope. He's going to use preachers and he's going to use talk show hosts. He's going to use others to remind you of the way that the world is falling apart. The way that your life is imperfect. After all, He is the Father of lies. But the truth remains. That God is Almighty. That God who created this world is the God who continues to sustain this world. That God who who has given us life continues to walk with us each and every day. That when our life is falling apart, when our life is broken to pieces, that He is right there with us picking it up. That our God is the one when we fall to our knees in tears, too weak to even lift our heads. He is the one that pulls us to His breast, clutches us in tightly, comforts us. That our God is the one who even in in the face of this evil, will be the champion. For on the cross, He defeated sin. He defeated death. And He defeated the devil. And He declared victory. And although He came as a baby, fragile, small and weak, bleeding and crying, He is not going to come again. Matthew 24 records Jesus' own words where Jesus tells us that when He comes again, He is coming in all power and authority and all glory and might that the King of kings, the Ancient of Days, is coming. 
And He is going to call His people to Him. He is going to reign forever and ever. And we are reminded to do that beautiful hymn, A Mighty Fortress. That one little word will fell our foe. One little word. And that is the word of faith in Jesus Christ. The word of God that He has given us to proceed through this life proceed through this life trusting that we have a king who is with us always to proceed through this life knowing that we know the rest of the story and so we pray amen come lord jesus amen please pray with me heavenly father we give thanks to you for sending us your gracious son christ jesus forgive us for those times when we allow our fears, our worries, our temptations to rule our lives, to overcome us. Forgive us for those times when we, when we forget that you are our King, that you are Lord of all. Remind us that you are always the powerful God, that you are always the powerful King, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and that you are reigning and you will one day come again to this earth. Help us always to know with confidence that even in the darkest hour, that you are the bright shining light, that you are the hope and promise of our salvation. May this be our trust this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, you know the rest of the story. <laughs>